you know, we're on a time frame. We're checking our watch. We're our phone is beeping. You know, we're we're just rushing, and we've only got ten minutes, and we feel like we need to get X, Y, and Z done. And what's your recommendation for people that are struggling with that sort of thing? I have a, quite a few of them. Most of them have have nothing to do with horses. Yeah, that's great. Um, um, these days I recommend people take up some sort of a meditation practice, like get some sort of a meditation app on your phone, like Headspace is a good one and start out with, you know, a two or three minute meditation a day. It takes, takes a bit of, of doing, but you know, like they say, if you, if you, you should meditate and if you don't have time to do for 20 minutes a day, you should meditate for 20 minutes twice a day. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's it really, it's, it's, yeah, I'll I tell you what, I, something I started doing uh, last year, year before, I was told this practice to count judgmental thoughts. So when you wake up in the morning, count judgmental thoughts during the day. And what you find when you start counting judgmental thoughts is the first thing that happens, you become aware of how many judgmental thoughts you actually have. That's a big part of it. But then you also become aware of how many judgmental thoughts you have about yourself, which is a big part of it. And then you, then you kind of start to realize how much you actually beat yourself up about things. Yeah. And have you ever heard of Brene Brown? I have heard the name. I don't know anything about. Uh, Brene Brown's an amazing lady. She was a quantitative researcher, she was a therapist who was a quantitative researcher, but, um, now she's all her research that she ever did turned the, the thing that popped up that's the scourge of society is shame and she she quantifies the difference between guilt and shame is shame is i am stupid guilt is i did something stupid but next time i won't sort of thing you know what i mean and so a really good exercise is to count be aware of your judgmental thoughts during the day like try to keep that in the front of your mind is that a judgmental thought and count these judgmental thoughts so then you realize how many you have but then you realize how many you have about yourself and then you can reframe them instead of going, Oh, I'm so stupid. You can say, Oh, well, that was a stupid thing to do. I remember not to do that next time. And so it takes that, that heavy weight of self-loathing or whatever the hell we all have, you know, that whole, oh, you're not good enough and all that sort of stuff. It kind of, it just starts to chip away at, at that. And I really think, when you start chipping away at that stuff, it really, that's when it starts helping with your horses because you can also reframe things your horses do. Just, so just learning to reframe judgments. And so when your horse does whatever, instead of going, oh, he's doing that because he, he's trying to get at me and he's trying to, you kind of go, well, he's doing that because that's what he feels he needs to do to survive right now. But in, it's, it's uh, I think it's anything you need to do with your horse, I think is a good thing to do away from your horse. Like practice that, that, personal growth stuff um the horse is where you get to test it out but you don't you know if you're trying to change that about you only when you're working with your horse it's going to take forever and and you're going to in, you're going to inject a lot of that stuff into your horse whereas if you can work on it you know away from that and then use those skills that you've got to um to then use it when you're with your horse i think that's I think that's really helpful. Yeah, I think that that is too. And I think that's really helpful for, pe for people to hear because sometimes I think people think they need to do it all with their horse, but there's so much going on and it's so hard to control all those little nuanced internal thoughts and feelings when you're with your, with your horse and, and it empowers them to then work on their horsemanship when they're away from their horse and become that person that they can then take to their horse and then get the feedback from their horse, you know, whether they're on the right track or not, because the horse will give you a pretty clear idea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that's, that's, that's probably a big suggestion I'd make these days is, is, you know, all that, all that sort of stuff, especially the, especially the meditation. I think the meditation is, is so, you know, these days Navy SEALs meditate. Right. You know, I mean, it's not like it used to be some weird guy with a tie-dyed T-shirt, cross it legged on a rock or something like that. Right. These days, you know, NFL players meditate, Navy SEALs meditate, CEOs meditate, 
everybody has some sort of a, you know, I think, because I think we need that these days because we're all addicted to our phones and we've just got emails and so much stuff going on. Whereas guys like, I once asked, I think it was Brian Newbit, but it wasn't Brian Newbit. It was, no, it was Kurt Pate is who I actually asked one time. I said, so what do you, how did the Dorrance brothers get that way? I mean, they didn't meditate. They didn't read Eastern philosophy. They, you know, they didn't go to see therapists. What? The? And he says, I think it comes from being poor and being around animals all your life. Yeah. They were the 10 year old girl their whole life. Yeah. Um, so I presented at uh, the best horse practices summit in Durango, Colorado a couple of years ago. And at the nighttime thing, we had a dinner. It's in an old, an old, town hall in um, Durango, Colorado. It's beautiful, but at, oh, it's an old theater is what it is. And so at night time we had a dinner and the after dinner entertainment was Brian Newbert and uh, Randy Ryman up on stage telling stories about the Dorrances. Uh -huh. One of the stories one of them told was that the, they had a herd of registered Angus cattle. Okay. And they had a I think they were tattooed under their lips, but they also had a tail tag on them that had their number on them. And Tom was away one time, and while he was gone, Bill cut the tail tags off this, I think there was 50 of these cows. So they're Black Angus cows. So I don't know if you know what a herd of Black Angus cows yeah. looks like, but they're identical. Yeah. And so when, when um, I hope I get the story right, but when Tom came home, he said to Bill, what happened to the tail tags? And Bill said, oh, I cut those things up, we don't need them. And Tom was like, well, how are we going to tell them apart? And Bill goes, oh, I, I know every one of them. He goes, well, how many when they know their numbers? He goes, well, I know them and their numbers. And Tom was like, really? And Bill says, yeah, let's go rope some. So they go out there and Tom had roped the head, Bill had roped the heels, and then Tom would hop off his horse and walk down. And before he got down there, Bill would tell him the tattoo number before he got there and have a look at it. And I only roped about four of them and he got every one of them right. And Tom goes, wow. okay, well, you do know. But he memorized the numbers of 50 black Angus cows that are all the same age and the same shape and the same height. I mean, how do you do that? Yeah, that's amazing. That's like, that's like being so present. It's not funny. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Wow. There was another brother, uh, I think his name was Fred, and they said he had the best memory of all of them. So I've been uh, told. He so... Could, he could, yeah. So there's just, there's just something, I don't know, it must have been something about where they grew up or whatever, but um, I, we had, I met a lady the other day and she grew up in, um, Arizona, close to the Mexican border and her parents divorced when she was very young and she went with her father and she was like two years old and she went with her father. And so her grandfather was, a. I can't pronounce the name of it. It's a, an Indian tribe starting with a Y. Is it Yakavai or something like that? But her grandfather was a, a was a cowboy who worked on a ranch, but he was a, a, of that Indian tribe. And she spent all her childhood with him. And she said that he'd put her on the back of the saddle and they'd ride out. They might, they might come over a rise and he would just stop and say, tell me when you see it. And she said she might sit there for half an hour and just observe everything that's going on. And she'd go, well, there's a pair of red hawks over there that have, that look like they're like their lifetime mates or something or other, you know, things like that. And he'd go, look in the fork, have a look at the mountain line and the fork of the tree on the left, you know, things like that. But she would just sit for hours and just observe things. Anyway, she is, she can communicate with animals. She's got that, you know, that mind, body, inner energy connection thing. But I think she got it from her spending all this time with her grandfather who was by the, by the sounds of it, there's some sort of a mystical sort of a dude, but the story she told me were pretty crazy about some of the things that they, you know, she, she's experienced with animals, you know, right. just having that presence in her body, you know what I mean? But, you, you know, she learned that at a young age instead of having that phone or whatever, you know, sitting in front of the television, she spent hours and hours and hours and hours and hours just out in nature. And I think that's what the dancers, when they grew up, that's what they did, you know. I think that's that's so lacking now in in society in general, and it really is sad because it completely takes us away from who we are and the powers that are actually inside of us. You know, the powers that we're not able to access because 
we just put all this stuff on top of it. And um, my goal, we homeschool our kids, and my goal is to be able to just take them on the road with their horses and our horses and go explore the country and just trail ride and camp with the horses and just find that, just that presence with nature and just, yeah. just live, you know, live the life. <laughs> yeah. There's a, a lady that lives here in California named Kerry Lake. And okay. she's an animal communicator. Okay. But she teaches people how to do it. And she says, I'm not teaching you anything. I'm helping you remember. She says, we all, when we were kids, we were all in touch with all this stuff and we could, you know, there's information coming in and going out. And then we kind of get to where it's all just going out, not really in touch with all this sort of stuff. Um, I mentioned Jane Pike before, our mental coach yeah. for the Water Question Games. Her husband was a um, filmmaker for National Geographic and he tells a story about being in the jungle in the Congo and they were filming this tribe. And so he's doing all the camera work and the sound work. And there's the guy who's the microphone guy, you know, here yeah, we're in the Congo with this tribe sort of thing. And they would go out with them every day with the men hunting and they walk off into the jungle. And he said, it's so thick. You walk 10 feet away from the camp and turn around. You don't know how you got there. The canopy's so thick until the sun's up. You don't know what direction it's in, that sort of thing. And so after five days of wandering around the jungle for four or five hours a day, and then always finding their way back to camp, um, he said to the chief one day, so how do you find your way back to the camp? Because I, you know, you're not doing the Hansel and Gretel, you're not dropping breadcrumbs and I, I can't tell which way is which. And he said, oh, that's easy. We just ask the animals. And Giles was like, you know, but I've been filming you for the last five days. I have not seen you stop, look up at a monkey and go, hey, Mr. Monkey, where's my house? Can you see it from up there? Yeah. The guy says, oh, no, we don't talk to the animals. We talk to the animals wow and Giles is like you can, you can talk to the animals and he's like yeah can't you and Giles is like no and so the chief was like hey kids come over here I want to show you something this guy can't talk to the animals only he can do it it's perfectly normal for those people to be able to do it. I love it. And I think, I really think all the First Nations people of the world could do that sort of thing because they just had that connection to nature. They weren't all civilized like we are. And so that's what that Kerry Lake it talks about. She's talking about finding that again. She says, we're all born with it. And then we, you know, we're born with it to varying degrees. And then we have it civilized out of us, you know, she told, cause I said, well, how long have you been able to, to do it? Like get this feedback from animals? She says, it was my first language. I could do it before I could talk. And I said, so once you could actually speak and form words, how did it go when you told your parents, oh, by the way, the dog tells me this or the cat tells me this or the birds or whatever. And she said, oh, well, you know, as you can imagine, oh, don't be silly. You know, Carrie's just talking to her imaginary friends and that sort of thing, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so it's, yeah, it's interesting that, you know, I think at, a, at some point in time, especially if you grow up around animals, I suppose if you grow up in the city and you're not around animals, you probably don't ever get that connection anyway. But, uh, yeah, so it's interesting stuff. It is interesting stuff. And it shows you how deep it can go and how far you can actually take it. I presented at a horse expo in Minnesota, I think, this oh. year. The Minnesota Horse Fair, I think it was called. And sometimes at those horse expos, you know, I'm kind of the most well-known person there. And sometimes I'm the least well-known person there. So sometimes you're in the, the little arena over the back and the big guys are in the big Coliseum. But at this one, a couple of days, I was in the, the main Coliseum there. And one of the sessions I did, I talked for an hour about not training your horse. <laughs> like this, Like things that are not training, things about ways to create connection with the horse but it's not asking them to do things it's letting them know how present you are and you know maybe matching steps and just being just aware of little things and talking about when you ask for things asking with energy first versus a cue first and stuff like that and that place holds about five thousand people full so that by the end of it, i looked around there had to be a couple of thousand people in that 
that thing and they didn't leave you know what i mean there's actually more people coming in as i was there so i went back to the booth and um you know i told people if you want to have a chat come back to the booth so there's a i go back to the booth there's a line of people and uh i noticed in the line towards the back line was this big tall old craggy faced cowboy guy he's got an old dirty old straw hat on he's got like a really dirty car heart jacket on with bib and brace overall sort of thing you know and a lot of kind of enlightened people in the line asking questions about stuff and he finally gets up to the front and introduces himself and i'm thinking yeah this would be interesting and he says uh so sonny you were talking out there about using uh, moving horses with energy and i said yeah and he said do you want to know the best way to get a horse to move off your energy and i'm like sure and i'm thinking this is going to involve a big stick isn't it you know and he said, so what you should do is you should harness a great deal of energy in your root chakra and then bring it up into your heart space and breathe it towards them. <laughs> that was unexpected. <laughs> this is in Minnesota. <laughs> when I'm here in California, you kind of expect that. You know what I mean? But this was an old cowboy guy. He probably was about 70 something from Minnesota. And that was the... You could have knocked me over with a feather. That was the last <laughs> time I expected it. Oh, that's too funny. You never uh, know who you're going <laughs> to. Well, the thing is, I think, I think back in those days, that was common knowledge. You know, like that sort of thing. I did, a, it was, I did a clinic in Australia earlier this year, and a guy showed up the second day of the clinic and to watch and he was a craggy faced old cowboy looking fella too you know looked like a really old style horseman there and i you know he missed the whole introduction the first day so but i'm talking a lot about energy and we're working on moving horses with energy and intention and all that sort of stuff and he stuck around the rest of the day and i thought i bet this guy's over there thinking this you're an idiot <laughs> you know what i mean and when i was finished he stuck around and it looked like he wanted to chat so he came over and introduced himself and he said you know, you're talking about getting horses to move with energy. And I said, yeah, he said, when I was a boy, he said, I had an old guy show me, he said, if you have a horse in a round pen and you want them to come to you, the best way to do it is look at their hind, point your finger at their hind end, look at their hind end, and just imagine all the energy coming out of you down your finger towards that hind end. And if you do it for long enough, they'll just roll around and come up to you. <laughs> so that was two experiences this year where, so he was an older guy. He was probably in his early 60s and he learned from an old guy. It's the same thing. So I think all this stuff's just been lost. It's not like we're inventing something new here, you know, like the, the, right. the, 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 the tribe in the Congo and, and just things like that. It's, it's not, you know, everything old is new again. It's just we've, for a few generations, we've got away from that sort of thing that I think it's, we've just got to kind of, relearn it and i you know i you know i've changed quite a bit about what i did i've done in the last probably in the last three years so for me it's it's still pretty fresh in my mind because what i was doing before you know I, I was a professional trainer so i was a horse trainer i get the horse i train him how to respond to certain cues it doesn't matter if you give them i give them somebody else gives them they they work um and at the time, I was still doing it, but at the time I was traveling around the world doing clinics and I was helping people with their horses and it was working. And so in my mind, I was right because it works. It's working. And so that's not that very long ago. So I know when people who are not, say, where I'm in now, they're still right. Yeah. They're still right because in their experience, they're right. Mm -hmm. not like they know a better way or a different way this works for them and so so they're right so that really kind of for me it helps take the judgment out of when someone's not doing what you're doing yeah um i don't look at it and think when well, you're doing that wrong i look at it and think well that's your truth at the moment you know what i mean definitely and so and i think that helps you because if every person you see you think something negative about them that just adds up anyway you know i i took the year off last year from doing clinics i kind of wanted to take a step back and and well the plan was to take a step back and kind of sort some things out but we ended up doing the world of question games too so that was kind of fun 
Um, so I didn't travel much last year. I'm about traveling this year. And what I've realized after like that judgment thing I was telling you about. Yeah. What I've realized in the past when I travel, if I'm in an airport, if I'm walking through an airport or sitting in an airport and I'm people watching, I'm judging. <laughs> I'm not thinking the best thing about every person that's walking by, you know what I mean? And so what I had started doing was when I'm walking through the airport, when people walk the other way, I look them in the eye and I give them a little bit of an eye smile. They might not even look at you, but then I think, may you be happy in the next person? May you be happy? May you be happy? May you be happy? And what I found is you get to the other end of the airport and you have a completely different energy inside you than I used to have walking through an airport. So I realize now there's never nothing going on in here. It's either something negative or it's something positive. And if